Hello and welcome. I'm Karima Brown and you're watching Political Exchange where we unpack Africa's political economy. Mozambique is one of the continent's success stories with a strong government and a growing economy. The country has endured a 15-year civil war to become a significant Southern African energy player with huge gas fines and a thriving mining industry. To capitalize on its own infrastructure development goals, the Mozambique and Portuguese governments recently founded the National Investment Bank, which has facilitated and manage several infrastructure projects to facilitate growth and development. Joining me now to discuss the country's investment outlook is Stefan Morash. He's the Deputy CEO of the National Investment Bank of Mozambique. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank now, you. of course, you are here in the country to, uh, you attended the Afro-Brazil, uh, you know, business forum. And prior to, to us, uh, um, you know, going live, you were saying that it is a sign of confidence of Brazilian investors in Africa. Um, is that, um, you know, confidence also expressed in the economy of Mozambique? Absolutely. In fact, uh, Mozambique and Angola are traditionally the biggest recipients of uh, Brazilian investment, which is natural given the, the, co the common language and also the fact that these countries are investing significantly in infrastructure and you have uh, a number of strong uh, contractors from Brazil and also players from the extractive industries such as Vale which are interested in developing projects in these countries. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the investment bank, um, it's a year old, it's very recent. Um, take us through who the major players are and what the creation of the, of the bank is meant to help facilitate in terms of fast stacking the Mozambican economy. Right, I think the shareholders, which are essentially the Mozambican state on one uh, hand and Portuguese bank Caixa Geral Deposit on behalf of the Portuguese uh, uh, state, uh, have decided it was time to set up an investment and development bank to help fuel the growth of the country. Because uh, the Mozambican economy, and particularly the financial sector, is already quite strong in terms of retail banking, and you have a number of foreign Portuguese and South African banks uh, present. But on the investment banking side, there was no local player. Uh, and particularly with the expectant um, revenues from the mining and oil and gas uh, industries in Mozambique, um, a decision was made that this, uh, that this should be accompanied by, by the creation of a bank that could further fuel the, the growth of the country and the, the broader uh, inclusiveness of growth for the whole population. Mm -hmm. But are there any private sector players involved in the bank or are they largely just um, you know, state-driven participation? This is essentially state-driven, although uh, one of the shareholders is also uh, a retail bank, uh, which has a small uh, percentage, a retail bank owned by Caixa, but that has private shareholders. So it's not entirely uh, state-owned. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we know that infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges, not just in Mozambique, but in fact in the whole of the continent. Uh, recently, the uh, SADC countries um, announced and adopted a major infrastructure rollout, uh, some saying equaling 550 US, uh, a billion US dollars. Of course, very, very ambitious mm -hmm. programs. Situate, if you like, uh, Stefan, for me, Mozambique and your bank's role within that broader SADC uh, context. Right. Mozambique plays a very important role in the region uh, because it is um, a nexus to the sea to some of these countries. Uh, cross-border transactions and commercial transactions are increasing significantly and then obviously you have particularly the extractive industries uh, mining and gas with significant recent discoveries and for those discoveries to be supported and, and, and to grow they need to have infrastructure and these countries in general lack a lot of infrastructure to, to enable economic activity industry agriculture etc to, 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 to prosper and Mozambique only has significant investment plans which are potentially above 50 billion to 100 billion dollars over the next decade, uh, theoretically at least, and much of this has to do with, with infrastructure. Infrastructure meaning energy transmission lines, meaning roads, bridges, ports, upgrading airports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to serve particularly the extractive industries, but then you have the uh, derived benefits from those infrastructures to serve the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, Mozambique, as we said earlier, endured a very long and bitter civil war. We saw the, the very little infrastructure that it, there was post-colonialism virtually destroyed, um, leaving some parts of Mozambique incredibly isolated. Um, 
Take us through what uh, significant infrastructure um, progress has been made to kind of restore, you know, those uh, uh, um, communications lines, uh, the ability to hook the, the, the country up and get goods flowing from one point to the other. Right. I think it's, it's important to remember that the civil war um, finished in the beginning of the 90s. So uh, the country has been experiencing quite stable peace for a long time now, almost two decades of peace and, and democracy. Uh, together with foreign institutions such as the World Bank and other multilateral institutions, the government has created um, local institutions which are strong and which have been working with donor uh, countries and now with foreign investors in upgrading these infrastructures. So currently you have fairly good you know, road, roads across the country, uh, much broader access to, to energy and certainly to cell phone technology and others. So. Uh, we believe now the country will enter a second stage where it will move from the very basic infrastructure into an upgrade, into, into a, a faster mode of growth that will um, encompass uh, you know, a broader participation of different regions of the country which were not so well served up till now. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, um, you know, there's a lot of ambition from the SADC governments to get Africa growing and to get its population to share in the dividend of this, you know, the growth spurt. Um, where are you going to get the private capital from um, to match this ambition? Because obviously we understand that the state has a very definite role to play. Um, but what is it that the private sector needs to bring to the party? Well, essentially, uh, like anywhere else in the world, the projects have to be profitable. <laughs> That's the number one thing, particularly when you're moving from a donor-assisted economy to an investment uh, and consumer, internal consumption-driven uh, economy. So it ne needs to be profitable. Uh, the states need to um, set up a set of rules and regulations that welcome the foreign investors and that balance the interests of the foreign investors and that profitability, which is obviously needed anywhere, uh, with also the inclusion of the local population, the creation of employment, uh, the training of the population, because you need vast amounts of very skilled people to manage gas, oil investments, coal investments, electricity investments, roadworks, etc. So what is important is that the states, and particularly in Mozambique, set up a framework that welcomes uh, the foreign investors in a natural way in a benefit for all uh, kind of manner. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, during the war um, and and in the period of the rule of the of Frelimo, the ruling party of Mozambique, it had had a um, quite a, a protectionist approach to the economy in the sense that it was a socialist uh, 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 liberation movement. Um, of course, since the, the wars ended, the world has changed, the globe has changed. To what extent is the economic policy framework within Mozambique um, taking into account these, these changes? But of course, also in such a way that it deals with the very issues that you raise, that the population is not left behind, that you're not just enabling companies to come in and drill and take and extract you know, uh, precious raw materials. Yes, I think we have to take into account that uh, whenever there's a transition from, from a more socialist economy into a more uh, market-driven economy, you can't do it in a couple of years and probably not even in a couple of decades. Um, most of even the Western nations, which we now consider to be very liberal in, term, in economic terms, also had protectionist uh, measures during the time of their growth, uh, a few decades or centuries ago. So it is normal that these, these countries open up gradually and want to protect also and in enable local uh, firms and local companies to grow alongside with international investors. And uh, our view is that the government has developed together with international partners such as the World Bank, the IMF and other, other institutions as, such as the IFC, uh, a good set of regulation that brings a balance between the interests of foreign investors but also the interests of a rising uh, entrepreneurial class and the rising uh, middle class uh, that wants to consume and wants to grow and has the right to share the benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in many African countries that are mineral rich, you find the very rich and the very poor and no middle class in between. And of course, there are certain things that must happen to grow a middle class. You need to get more kids into school. You need to have proper infrastructure in terms of internet access and broadband penetration. You need to have you know, a skills path where people feel that they can there's, a, there's a, a place for them in their country. The current uh, kind of social planning in Mozambique, 
is that on track to support the creation of a Mozambican middle class that can effectively take charge of the running of, of, of the country and business opportunities? Uh, it's a process. It's a process. And I think the advantage for Mozambique is that it can look at other countries, such as Angola, Nigeria, and other, other examples in Africa and elsewhere, where there were problems, uh, there were solutions, uh, there were uh, different solutions and they can look at what happened and what went right and what went wrong. Um, and again, the, the, the big difference is it's a country that has been uh, closely connected to the international community and to international institutions for almost 20 years. So the institutions on average are quite strong if you compare to other countries in the region and therefore there is an awareness uh, from the government, government from our perspective that these are issues that have to be taken care of. There is an awareness that it is not sustainable uh, to develop a country where some have everything and all the others have nothing. Um, and therefore, when you're talking about extractive industries, there are plans and there are studies being made about how you can leverage those extractive industries and add value and, and, and build industries around gas and around coal that actually generate jobs and therefore indirectly create benefits for everyone. Mm -hmm. Obviously this is a difficult path and it's a big country, it's 22 million people nowadays and a largely uneducated population, so it's, it's a process. Mm -hmm. Now of course uh, when we spoke initially about who constitute this bank, we spoke about the fact that it's the governments of Mozambique and, and Portugal. Um, now we know the Eurozone is in a massive crisis and of course countries like Portugal has suffered tremendously um, as a consequence of that Eurozone uh, meltdown. Um, how does this impact uh, in terms of the Portuguese government's commitment to remain in the bank and how has it affected you know, the bank's ability to access um, you know, capital markets and so on? Right. Obviously, I cannot speak on behalf of, of both governments, well, at least uh, not even my, uh, the Portuguese government. But it is, um, uh, I think what is important is that there is a long, long time partnership between the countries. It's an historical partnership. Um, Portugal has been one of the minor investors in Africa, and particularly on Portuguese speaking Africa, for many decades, um, particularly even since uh, the end of the, of the civil wars in Angola and, and in Mozambique. You have a, a lot of qualified Portuguese uh, currently working in these countries, and a lot of Portuguese firms coming into these countries. On the other hand, obviously, you have uh, a Mozambican state which has good perspectives of growth. Um, which uh, has good perspectives in terms of managing on the most professional way their resources and naturally their uh, investment uh, and development bank. Uh, so it's quite natural that this bank is more Mozambican than, than, than Portuguese and that, that's the way it should be and that's, that's, uh, that's how it will be. Stefan, when we come back uh, we will talk a little bit more about some of the challenges your bank faced but we have to take a short break. When we come back we talk about whether corruption has the ability to derail Mozambique's economic investment plans.